Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third presentation of the day. Morris is looking uh, kind of worried because he doesn't know what I'm going to say <laughs> as it is an introduction. Oh, it's going to be interesting. It's just innocent introduction to a man that needs actually no introduction because everyone knows that he is uh, the Antagma, half of Antagma. So, and the title is pretty straightforward. So I'll just let you take it from here. Thanks so much. That was more gentle than I expected. <laughs> no br no so, brown in the pants. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hidden Gems in H19.5. Um, I'm going to do a bit of expectation management first. Uh, this um, session has been scheduled for an hour, which is a total lie. It's going to last more 30, 40 minutes. I'll try keeping it briefly. And what you're gonna, or what you can expect from this is first, um, I'll talk you through some experiment um, I did with a friend of mine. Um, in teaching um, at the beginning of this year. Then I'm going a bit into uh, Houdini 19.5 and a few neat gems um, I found for use in motion graphics. And finally, I'll give you uh, bad advice on ruining your life um, in the industry when using Houdini. Um, Fiona already, already introduced me. This is me with Photoshop cream on. This is me without Photoshop cream. I'm Moritz Schwind, and usually I'm teamed up with this guy who can't make it or couldn't make it because he's a professor by now, and I'm very jealous for that. Um, and we run in Tagma, um, tutorial side. Um, we do weekly tutorials on procedural generative design, mainly Houdini. In recent days, um, also a few other tools, but still mainly Houdini. Um, like, comment, subscribe, support us on Patreon. Um, so earlier this year, um, I got into, into the situation that um, under some circumstances, we started performing an experiment. And the subject was this guy, um, actually, the human, not the dog. And uh, this is Vincent, Vincent Schwenk, buddy of mine, uh, working as a visual and emotion designer in Hamburg, Germany. And we go way back uh, to university. And Vince um, usually designs artworks like these. And in his own words, he creates futuristic candy-colored blobs and glossy shapes from album sleeves to corporate branding projects, or from conference identities to digital art, unquote. And these are kind of his last artworks. So he always goes for this kind of abstract style, composition, shape-wise, very realistically rendered. Now, the issue with Vince is this. He's very much a cinema guy. And by that, I mean this, which you might recognize from this. So that's where he comes from. And I've been trying to talk him into Houdini um, for the past years. Because in my opinion, it's very, very um, apt for what he's doing. Because Houdini, in contrast to other DCCs out there that he might have been using or you might have been using, um, is more stable. It offers a greater variety of physically based solvers. And it's way more adaptable and extendable than any other solution out there, which comes in handy when you're working for a certain type of client in motion design, a client that requires on the one hand, realistic, almost VFX-like quality in the execution of the work, but on the other hand, very abstract, very unconventional um, shapes, forms, and a design language, which is not very common in VFX or FX. So there you've got your adaptability coming in handy. And finally, um, Vincent caved this year, and he gave in um, and let me um, try teaching in Houdini. Uh, which ended up in these three videos we put online, and they're a bit different from our usual videos, which you can already see by looking at their length. Our usual videos are very short form, like 5 to 20 minutes, getting to the point, getting straight to the point. And this one was a bit more meandering, so just recording him and me, um, talking him and walking him through his very first Houdini setups. And people appreciated that and commented, and uh, this one kind of caught my mood. Um, if any one of you has ever tried um, teaching, communicating Houdini to an artist, to a designer, when you're coming from a TD background, you might get the feeling. So let's talk a bit about motivations of artists and designers and what they tell you or what Vince told me. And take this with a grain of salt. This is just a one singular example. So you might find this an artist. You might not. You might find this for yourself. You might not. So we tried isolating why Vince actually bothered and caved into my, uh, me pressuring him into learning Houdini. And weirdly enough, the very first thing he said was vellum. Because vellum apparently is what he sees Houdini being these days. Um, when you watch his Instagram or when you watch the Twitter, you are bombarded with these vellum sims, these beautiful complex or complex appearing vellum sims. Um, so that was his main go-to because it was fed up with the cloth solver, with the soft body software of the tool he was using. 
Then he perceived Houdini as being uh, or offering less limitations and thus more creative freedom. Again, the adaptability and um, the means to go beyond a certain interface that was designed to pull off one certain shot in a more traditional pipeline, maybe. And then finally, the procedural design possibilities. Again, when you're working for a certain type of client, let's for example take a North American sportswear brand, um, it can happen that you get a mail on Monday requesting like 30 style frames, 30 mood frames by Wednesday, which you can pull off if you've got either a really good, really quick concept artist, um, or you're willing to work incredibly long hours, or you have a procedural setup where you can um, crank out varieties in an easy manner. To quote Vincent, that in the end, uh, he doesn't care about software. He just wants uh, some software that helps him deliver his creative ideas. Um, and it's weird to think of Houdini as that first, because it's so technical. Um, which brings us to why he hesitated using it and why it took me like three years to convince him. The first thing, and I think we are particularly to blame for that, is the perception that um, in order to use Houdini efficiently or effectively, you have to code or have to script. And that is not the case, especially not anymore. It's going more and more into the direction of just stringing together um, nodes. It's just that I personally and Manuel, we found our way into Houdini through using the scripting language, through using Dex. Because back then we had the feeling of being overwhelmed by the whole interface, by the whole nodes. And when you're coming from a background that you, maybe you have experience in Arduino, in processing, in Java, or in Python, all you need to do um, to learn Houdini is to crank open the VEX reference page and start coding uh, without having to learn some weird nomenclature that some nodes might have, some weird user interface things, for example, using the add node to delete geometry and stuff like that. So you just start coding. And that's just how we got into there. Um, also, typically, you're stuck at, the, uh, at your daily business. So it leaves you with like the evenings and the weekends to learn Houdini. And I think Manu and I, we've been particularly lucky with our partners being very, very tolerant of that. So in the beginning when we were learning Houdini, like half a year, every free minute, every spare time, we spent in front of the computer and uh, our partners luckily led us and very, very, very thankful and very grateful for that. But typically it's not the normal thing that you would expect in your life or from your partner. So let's talk about overcoming these hurdles or trying to communicate um, Houdini to a designer or more design-centric audience. So I think there are very basic foundations, very few principles that you have to communicate in order to get people on board with Houdini and accept its quirks and actually see its power. So the thing is, the question to answer is, um, what makes Houdini so special and what sets it apart from other DCCs such as Blender, Maya, 3ds Max, um, or Cinema 4D? And the single most important thing, in my opinion, is that working in Houdini means working with data. When an artist, in my opinion, and I was the same, when I used other tools, um, I only perceived the tools as, well, a tool to um, create a certain means, a certain effect, a certain output. In contrast to that, Houdini is just wrangling data, mingling with data. So let me give you an example. Typically, spheres or surfaces in real life are perfect these just perfectly flat or perfectly curved surfaces. Computer graphics, of course, we know that doesn't exist. So usually the way you approach, for example, this geometry is uniformly distribute points, connect them through edges and form the polygons. And then next to stirring position and connectivity data, you store, for example, color on the points, which you can then interpolate along the edges or even along the primitives, the polygons. Nothing special so far. That's vertex colors. That's implemented in any type of DCC so far. However, the thing that I found extremely helpful when communicating the powers of Houdini is that you can not only store fixed preset data values on those points or on your geometry, but you can wrangle it and you can mingle with it and you can do with it whatever you like. For example, instead of storing colors and positions, let's store spring constants and damping on those individual points and then run them through a physics simulation. So you end up by just changing a bit of data and attaching the right solver nodes to it, you end up totally swapping out the meaning of what the data and what the geometry in Houdini actually means. Or if you want to go further, take the sphere as a representation of a world map, then um, load in the coordinates of some airports and try um, tracing their connecting flights for, uh, through one single day. And you end up with this really intricate um, visualization of flights happening on a given date um, throughout the world. So that's the underlying, the main thing um, that I typically try communicating new people that come into Houdini. It's a bit more like Excel in a way, more like an IDE, where you just attach and wrangle data. 
And then the thing is, when you're starting out learning Houdini, you're overwhelmed by this wealth of context, this wealth of functionality it offers you. So what I usually do is um, I have people focus on stops because it's very rewarding. You can immediately see what you're doing in the viewport. It's, it remains interactive in most cases, and you can easily export to another DCC that you're more used to because in the beginning, let's face it, you're most likely a bit hesitant to render in Houdini. And that's changing and that has changed uh, with the introduction of Karma and Solaris, and we'll talk about that. But so far, exporting from SOPS was one of the ways that I could get Vince into doing this. And this is what he was able to create after like three hours um, and three sessions. So I'm really happy with his progress. Um, and you can see that when it comes to motion graphics, it's not only the tech. I mean, the sim here has its quirks and errors and it's jittery here and there. But it kind of still works as its composition with the colors, with the lighting. So having a good eye allows you, and a good taste in rendering allows you to get away with some technical errors. So that's about the first part of trying to get people, uh, artists, artists, yeah, design-focused people into using Houdini. Let me talk about um, a bit of the tidbits I found, the gems in 19.5 uh, when I quickly glanced over the presentation and thought about how to abuse and abuse them for motion graphics. Um, and let's talk tangent fields first. I mean, they've been touched on previously in some presentations. I just want to go over them. And uh, yeah, let's go to the critical, to the more exciting part and do a live demo here. Uh, when preparing this, I was expecting that we'd have a workstation set up here, which we don't. So I'm running this on a laptop. Bear with me. <laughs> um, this might be slow. So. Um, this is the final rendering, which I paused. Let's try and resume it and uh, see if the laptop can keep up with it. All right, good. Um, I'll pause it again and uh, step you through uh, the setup. So usually, currently, and I'm debating if uh, we, should, we should change this, but currently I'm still sticking to the classic workflow. That means geometry context here and then working in SOPS to create our geometry. In this case, um, it's pretty straightforward what I'm doing here. So I'm uh, basically just creating um, a bunch of um, abstract shapes by copying a bunch of elongated spheres um, on a scattered point cloud, then um, VDBing them, smoothing them out, and converting them back to a mesh, and then just remeshing. So I end up with this kind of isotropic-ish, so uniform-ish triangle mesh. Um, put normals on it, and then the star of the show is the tangent field node. Um, that is new in Hidouni 19.5, and um, by now it's, it's no secret where this comes from, especially when you look at the artwork, you can already see kind of quads appearing there in the geometry, so this is going to be an essential part of quad remeshing. And what this does, and what you can see here with those individual um, markers here, is it creates a vector field stored on these individual points with those four vectors per point, um, pointing in the direction of a smoothly uh, varying field that is, in this case, guided mainly by the shape's geometry. So again, foundation for later remeshing, maybe. Also, what you can see here are those individual points. These are singularities. Singularities, for anyone who doesn't know them, there is this weirdly named theorem. It's called hairy ball theorem. It really is. So if you imagine a billiard ball, an eight ball, and put hairs on it, and you want to comb those hairs so they lie flat and smoothly on the surface of the sphere of the ball, you always end up with this at least one spot where they all diverge from. It's usually the spot that at least I have back here and most of the other males I know also have them. That's usually the balding spot. That's where it begins, like where the hairs diverge. Um, the thing is, with those tangent fields, with most geometry, um, you end up with multiple um, singularities like this. So where the vector field diverges, where it just spreads out from. Again, not really important for now, but maybe uh, for remeshing um, in a future version of Houdini. So this, by default, stores those four fields out, of the, out as those four vectors, again, stored on these individual points here. And um, all I'm doing here is blurring out those vectors a bit to kind of smooth those irregularities, to have a smoother flow of particles um, over this whole field. And then what I'm doing is also taking this geometry here, remeshing it a, a bit coarser, and then just deleting random points here so that I end up with, let me make them a bit bigger with those bunch of points, which are the source points, um, that I'm going to advect by using a solver here. So what I'm doing here is just moving along those points um, along the surface, just by plainly looking up the closest position to each point 
on this incoming geometry, then taking the vector field and then just moving the point along this direction. Which I can then pipe into a trail node and then I generate those really nicely undulating trails on my geometry. I do that once in a forward direction, I do that in a backward direction here, and then down here I also do that um, perpendicularly to the field. So I get these kind of crossing, uh, orthogonally crossing lines in here. All that is piped into a time shift so that when I merge it, um, I have it fixed at a certain um, simulation state like this. So no matter where I am in my simulation, it always outs but this one single frame here. And all I'm going to do now for shading, lighting, and rendering is coloring each individual line here in a different color by just looking at the connectivity, so seeing which points are connected into one geometry, um, and then trying to avoid vex this time using an attrib remap and the color node, um, just dialing in those colors just by creating this ramp and you can kind of art direct which color your amps should have. Similarly, I'm coloring the underlying geometry and um, then for the lines I only set a width attribute to tell the render engine how thick those lines should be and also both on the lines as well as on the underlying geometry I'm keeping a tangent attribute. For the lines it just indicates the direction into which the lines go or into which the points of the lines point, uh, the points of the lines point. Um, and for this underlying geometry, it's that tangent field. More about that when we come to render. Then just an out now. And now for rendering. So now I think with um, Houdini 18 and 19.5, um, I'm at a point where I'm willing to use or looking forward to use Karma XPU as my main render engine, at least for the Entagma content. Um, you've heard the previous, if you were lucky enough, you've heard the previous um, uh, presentation uh, by RISE about their implementation of Karma in their workflow. They rely on Karma CPU, um, which has been a bit more mature, but I think now Karma XPU has come a long way, which is really handy for artists because you can run it on a single workstation, you slam like one or two GPUs in there, uh, run it on the GPU, and it's competitive in speed almost with um, Octane and almost with Redshift, and it's built in, and it'll render most of the stuff that you throw at it. So let's talk about how to set up and use that. I've been mentioning that I'm still using this um, original um, SOP and Geo context. Um, and then I'm just importing this using a SOP import. So here is, this is just pointing to the out node I created before. I'm pondering if I'm leaving this object workflow in context for um, the stage context here. Because you can also use a SOP create and then down here just work normally in SOPs, which I did for the backdrop here, just creating a cyclorama by bending um, a grid. So that might be an option for future tutorials, we'll see. Anyways, importing uh, the geometry here. The next thing I usually do is um, applying shaders to that. Let me just restart that render. Again, on a laptop, so don't expect it to be super quick. Uh, I'm using the material library for uh, shading and assigning shaders. And in this case, um, I'm using Material X. So with Karma XPU, you are bound to use Material X um, as it renders most reliably and it's actually built uh, for Material X. In this case, I'm just um, starting out um, slamming together the material um, right on the Material Lib's um, top contents, which is so-so practice. We'll go about better practice in a second. And in here, I'm using the uh, Material X standard surface. So that's your standard Uber shader, so to say. In here, I want to use the colors um, I set up as my base color. Um, in this case, usually from Houdini, you would expect to load in the CD attribute that you set. Not so in USD. By default, this has been renamed when importing. That's one of the headache stuff that you have to find out when first working with USD. So in here, you see your scene tree. And when you click on the surface or on the curves, you can down here scroll down uh, to see all the attributes and attributes names. Um, and how they potentially have been renamed. For example, here my CD has been automatically renamed to display color. It does that to UV as well, which is called ST, um, which took me about two days of almost crying to find out. The beauty of using new tech. Uh, and you can read those um, attributes either using the USD Primbar reader or another note, which I'll talk in the next setup. And here I'm reading in the display color, piping that in the base color. Um, doing the same for an attribute that I set, which is called lines. Um, it's just one on the lines and zero on the underlying geometry, just to um, dive in both the specular roughness, depending on if it's a line or if it's the underlying geometry, as well as the specular anisotropy. Anisotropy just being that fake brushed metal look where you get those elongated reflections, um, depending on the brush direction. 
Speaking of the brush direction, um, the shader can read in our tangent value in here and use that as a brush direction for the um, anisotropy. So it's really nice. So you can now brush a metal and just like, I don't know, um, letters brushed in there or logos brushed in there or just have it follow the tangent lines as in here. And then the only other thing that you might be seeing here are those dents a bit. I wanted to break that up using a procedural bump map, which also gave me half a day of almost crying. Um, because it should be straightforward. Currently, Material X, however, is a bit low levelish. So what I'm doing here is these three nodes are just a procedural noise, um, just your standard Material X noise, and then a uh, global position with a multiplier to be able to dial in the scale of that. That goes into a height to normal, which in other terms would just be called bump map, but okay. Um, and that again goes into the normal map, which also needs the surface normal to work. And that goes into finally the normal slot of our shader and we're done. After that, I created and uh, positioned and merged another background, which in the material library, similar to what I did here, just a standard background shader with a specular dial down and just the base color set to a dark gray. Then your dome light, in this case, um, I was lazy, just went with a dome light with an HDR um, and I just dialed in the intensity here, increased that a bit and transformed it so the reflections kind of made sense to me. And then finally, dropping down a camera, um, usually locking it to the viewport, maybe looking through it actually. Come on, look through this camera. And then it's your comma render settings and maybe a USD render up to render this out to disk. Again, this in this case, it's kind of slow because I'm running on this laptop, um, but you can see it's still staying reactive and still converging way better than you'd expect from Karma CPU or even uh, Mantra. So that's one of the setups. Um, the other setup uh, I wanted to briefly go over is, let me just show you the, <laughs> wait, yeah. This is the animation that we're gonna build. And this is um, using and abusing another uh, neat tool that I found and that might have been mentioned today. It's a shallow water salt. So to build this, Uh, to build this, what I did is in geometry here. In geometry here, um, I set up height fields. So the shallow water solver works um, in the height field context with the height field nodes. So height field nodes are just two dimensional um, volumes with uh, luminance indicating how high something should protrude from the ground plane. In this case, I loaded in just our logo with this outer rim that kind of serves as a boundary for the fluid. I also loaded in a mask, which is this, just that masking of these four areas here. Um, again, just a PNG, I think 1000 by 1000 pixel. And by default, it's set up to just load as the mask layer. Then um, I added a bit of noise just to make the uh, simulation that I'll run through this a bit more organic, break it up a bit. Uh, and did the same thing here for um, these masks here. And I also, in here, I animated this noise by just moving it through space. So again, this is kind of sluggish on this machine, but I think you can see this red areas changing and undulating. So just again, to break it up a bit, just to make this emission of water a bit more non-uniform. And then it's already time to uh, drop down and use the shallow water solver. I'll go through the settings from the back. So the most important is the bindings. Here's where you bind those individual layers, those individual masks of your height fields, uh, which does what? In this case, I abused the mask, the red fields um, as my sourcing layer and everything else is just set up as default. Um, again, this does not play as fast as I wish it to play. Um, again, used on a laptop. Um, just be aware, I'll skip through it. it does a decent job at simulating this water that's being pushed into this quote unquote height field, this area, and um, bouncing off of these areas where the logo is. The thing is, I'm not interested in uh, the simulation and there is a great um, help file as well. So um, there's a great um, demo scene in the help file where they flood a whole canyon, really nice, uh, really brilliantly set up. It's a good tool for that. I'm more interested in another vector field that this thing spits out. So when I hit the info tab, it doesn't only spit out uh, height and water, but also a velocity field with the velocities for this water. And all I'm gonna do 
is take my original height field and through a bound and a blast, use that to scatter a bunch of points in here, in this case 30,000 points. Just relax them a bit so they sit more uniformly. And then using our trusty old volume trail to trail those individual points. Let me just switch that to a dark background here. And then in the volume trail, I just tweak this color ramp to go away from this garish infrared map that you usually have there. And that's all there is to it. Um, added a width again to kind of give a thickness to those lines and then put those to an out node. And then let's talk about rendering again. Just a few more hints on Karma XPU and Solaris. So again, you can see the tree looks oddly familiar. That's how most of my trees in Solaris look at this point. Um, importing my stuff in here, creating a backdrop here. And then again, using material library to attach the material to this. And in here, I finally used I think what's the better or more cleaner way of shading in Karma, Karma XPU, which is a Material X subnet. So you can have your individual shaders just packaged in one single subnet. And in here, also when you hit tab, no, <laughs> again, slow, you can see that we've got a massively reduced selection of um, nodes in here, which is really helpful because Houdini only offers you the Material X compatible nodes that side effects provides here. And I want to just point out one single thing, um, which is the uh, material X geometry property value, which is the node you need to read in those attributes from your geometry, from your points or from your vertices. Um, works really the same as the normal bind in Houdini or the uh, USD prim bar reader. Um, just give it a signature here, what you want in this case color, and then its name loads up the name here and then wire that into your normal standard base color of your shader. I think apart from that, um, the setup is pretty similar to the other one. Um, only thing here, I'd actually drop down a USD render uh, ROP just to save out this animation. Works really the same as your standard ROP out um, for Mantra, for um, Redshift, for Octane, whatever. Um, works the same. And again, if I set this to render and actually flag the final output here and set the camera correctly, we should be able to see this converge. Again, not terrific on this tiny um, laptop here, but it is converging and it is path tracing. So um, especially on an artist's workstation where you have a hefty CPU, this is absolutely valid for doing small scale motion graphics type of scenes. I'm not sure if I'd um, use it in full um, VFX production scenes though. So, okay, so far for the few tidbits that I found um, in 19.5 uh, so far, and there's a bunch of other stuff coming. So um, again, like, comment, subscribe on Antagma. Um, we'll push out um, a bunch of tutorials covering those. As soon as this display is extended, I'll continue. And as soon as PowerPoint is doing something. Okay, cool. The excitement, uh, we are past that. So to... <laughs> So uh, to wrap that up, uh, I want to pester you with an unsolicited guide to making your life miserable uh, in MoGraph and especially when using Houdini. Take this with a grain of salt and take this as either following this advice and actually making your uh, life miserable or try to avoiding these things. First is to make your life absolutely terrible, use one single tool and rigorously stick with it. Um, do not use any other tools that might be better adapted or that, that might give you a quicker um, output or that might, you might know better for a certain output. Just try rebuilding everything, in this case, in side effects Houdini, um, if you want to make your life terrible. Then all, uh, also, especially when it comes to design and commercials, always pursue the real thing. Doesn't matter if a tree is in the background 30 pixels high, it's going to be the simulated tree, full on leaves, geometry, everything. We did that. It's a nightmare. Um, when it comes to your setups, Documentation is purely optional and keep your documentation as loose as possible. I mean, colors alone are enough documentation because you will remember definitely what you wrote in there and an artist or another TD taking over your scenes, he or she, they will know. Um, also, this also side effects of documentation is optional because come on, face it, you know Houdini, right? You shouldn't look up the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the documentation on the geometry note here. Also on a, on a more uh, setup focused level, if you want to make your life totally miserable, you should absolutely use sub-level loops because they will make your life slow, really slow, especially if you, as an alternative, have a primitive wrangle or a primitive VOP or a point VOP or a point wrangle. And when it comes to building your setups and actually you go past these loops here and actually start scripting, 
Keep in mind that AMP or A or H is a really good parameter name for your artist. They will appreciate that, especially if it's not documented in the code. And when it comes to documentation and comments in the code, a shruggy usually is enough. And I literally had that happen to a code that came to me and I was like, magic happens here, shruggy, thank you. And finally, to make your life absolutely miserable, we covered that, don't render in Houdini. Just try exporting and importing in another DCC because the huge sims that you put out in Houdini will absolutely flawlessly import in any other DCC. No crashes or whatsoever, especially when a deadline is really tight. And also, um, be proud and don't use any prefabs, don't use any, any plugins, don't use mops. Um, why would you use something that is built for motion uh, graphics, um, especially if it interfaces with other tools in Houdini? And also never use labs tools. It's called labs for a reason. It must be experimental and it came from games, so why trust it? And finally, do not bother with VEX. Just go straight to OpenCL. It's super awkward. It's, it's very minimally documented. It's very awkward to debug and it's got lots of boilerplate code, so that's going to make your life really a hell. And then modeling Houdini, hard surface modeling in Houdini or sculpting Houdini is a pleasure. And finally, and finally, finally, and please keep this to your heart, ban Matt Estella. And don't log up his CG wiki, because why would you um, uh, want production tips from a really seasoned production guy who's good at teaching? Um, with that, um, thank you so much. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Um, if you have any ideas, if you think um, we are lacking anything, if you think you need a certain topic covered, if you're intrigued in anything, please drop us a mail. We are terrible at answering the mails. Uh, we read every single one of them, though. Uh, and some of your ideas actually make it in tutorial. So please don't be shy. Please don't be shy. We need your feedback. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, and, uh, and, and, and if you have questions, don't be shy asking them if you have questions. Uh, I wanted to ask it. Do you know? Did you notice? Uh, is there any kind of performance hit uh, when you're using a SOP import versus building something directly in Solaris? I didn't benchmark that, but I also had didn't have the impression that there was a performance hit. At least not noticeable to me. Maybe if I benchmarked it, yes, but nothing so blatantly apparent that I could feel it. But again, I'm working with really lightweight scenes, as you've seen here. Um, Typical Antagma setup is just this, a single object, a single sculptural object in front of a background. I think if your scenes get more elaborate, maybe, um, but I would be surprised if that's my gut feeling, but that's a gut feeling. Anyone else? No, you're free. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'll run. <laughs> I'll stick around for another 15 or 20 minutes here. So if you want to approach me, but then uh, I'll literally run to the airport and flee. <laughs> oh, is there another question or were you just yawning? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Are, are you, uh... oh yeah. <laughs> There's a story behind that, but uh, let's not go into that. <laughs> yeah, there's another one. <laughs> Do you know of any good resources for getting like familiarized with the Solaris business? Like... We are trying to um, increase our output on that. Um, uh, I think there are uh, there is a course on side effects, one or more. Um, I'm not sure how up to date that is, though. I think that's still 18.5 or night. <clears throat> sorry, or 19. I mean, you might have to correct me there. So uh, we are going to be releasing probably within, uh, like, before end of September. Uh, we plan to have updated several of the past documentations around, like, beginning uh, light, like, introduction to lighting in Solaris and uh, a couple of others. Uh, if you attended the presentation yesterday with LP, where he went over the bar scene, so uh, that's being updated with 19.5 and then we're going to also like he's going to do a brain dump and we're going to document all of that and just like go through the process of usd scene structure setup and all the all the etiquette of like unknown usd things oh there's an etiquette that makes life dangerous for me then <laughs> uh hi um <clears throat> I was just wondering, with your wealth of knowledge in Houdini, do you ever are you ever tempted to like get into production and do some shots here and there, or maybe you do and I'm just not aware of it? I mean, I was in production, um, and there's a reason I, I kind of try um, declining those jobs more and more. 
Just, and I, I don't want that tape, please. <laughs> so you just really enjoy the, the teaching aspect and being able to... I do enjoy the teaching aspect. I find it more fulfilling. I mean, the production I worked in was commercials and advertising. Um, so you're always uh, on very tight deadlines. Um, you're small teams, which also makes your life exciting. You're seeing uh, lots of facets of the industry and lots of um, a rather diverse set of skills that you have to have because you're almost a generalist, but they're not. Um, you're always working on very designy, abstractish stuff, which I appreciate and like. Um, but on the downside, um, you are confronted with tight deadlines, um, with, um, but with small-ish budgets, not only financially, but also tech-wise. So render farms aren't that big. Um, your teams are not that big. You usually are a three to six people team. Um, and I, I have the feeling, to be frank, that this industry, and especially commercial industry, selects for a certain type of character, um, which you'll have to have the energy to deal with um, in a longer term, in a long-term perspective, which at some point I didn't have anymore. Thanks so much. That got I... dark quickly. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyone else? All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks so much Thank for attending. Thank you, Moritz. Thanks. <laughs>